Hello. Do you hear me now? I see you. I see you. I hope you can hear me. Hello. A Stream on the Book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It was written in 1936. I mean, maybe. Around there. Or Yeah, no, it was, he wrote... It was 36. You know, but it took a long oh, time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really, to write the book. It wasn't just he wrote the book. He wrote a series of lectures, and he taught some classes, and eventually... It became a it book. It became a book. It came out of, like, a whole series of... In fact, it even started, he said, from some kind of pamphlet or something. Oh, hi, Ginger. He's not going to go for this. Our cat, by the way, is not going to go... How to... He's already having a... He's freak not out He's about not being locked this, so. upstairs. We, my heart Stuck breaks. My heart either breaks side. For the, <laughs> the poor kitten. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to even, you know, go through the method. He outlined, you know, what, what the method was or whatever. He even gave some kind of like practical um, It was like a nine point set of rules. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of rules. I'm not going to use all those exactly. People always talk about this book. You know, it's always held up as like the, you know, standard of books about socializing socializing hasn't been our strong suit necessarily no. i've so, had better and worse luck with it over the years but it's been yeah. kind of like a crapshoot it's not like because i you know did something right <laughs> like because i knew what i was doing because of the situation i was in yeah right just happened to work out yeah but no we need to have more control over that now yeah i think so socializing has to be way more important like it's almost the only skill you should really even be using. You know, I know. Well, not the only one, but you have to use it to propel your other stuff. Like, yeah, your other skills mean nothing without we're it. We're making a game yeah. and we need to know how to yeah. build an audience for it. Right. In a way that we haven't done before ever. Yeah, and that's a totally different skill than building a game. You know? Yes, so. completely different skill than building a game. So that's what we're here to learn. Is how to, you know, win friends and influence people. And so, he yeah. said that we would get it done in the first three chapters. Dude did promise. He said it was he like, promised. he said it would be like, like magic. magic. <laughs> I'm willing to give the dude three chapters. And he said we had to apply the stuff. It's like, I'll try it. I'll try it. A lot of it, it was Why like, not? Fuck it. a lot of the applications meant taking this book's notes been around and a, like reviewing yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're not going to take a note. <laughs> kind of following his rules. <clears throat> Hey, what's up, man? Dude, this is a tough year to be Do looking that. for a job. Look at us. We're, we, you know, we're trying to find work too. But, you know, you're in the same boat as us in a sense then. I mean, it is all about your socializing skill. That's exactly. how you get hired for this a job. This is it. That's why we're focusing on this now. You know, we've done all the technical stuff like learning how to stream and how to have a, you know, interesting narrative. All those kind of things that we looked up and, you know, tried to study and deal with, but we never dealt with the social aspect. And that's how you actually get a job and make money or get work. It doesn't even have to be a job. It can be work, right? Right. Work that pays you. Let's jump into it. Yeah, you want it? We're just going to start reading and commenting. So the whole the whole basis of the stream is just, you know, we hang out and bullshit, but at the same time, we're... We're going to read this. This is the sort of main topic. But feel free to comment on it and we'll come back and edit. So anything interesting points that come up or whatever, you know, will be in the video. Yeah. So if you feel like commenting or whatever, too, go ahead, man. You know, all right. All so right. Oh, wait. It. Part one. We have to read what it is. All right. Part one. Is a fundamental techniques in handling people. Uh, part one. If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. Mm-hmm. On May 7th, 1931, <laughs> the most sensational manhunt New York City had ever known had come to its, its climax. After weeks of search, Two Gun Crowley, the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink, was at bay, trapped in his sweetheart's apartment on the West End Avenue. 150 policemen laid seat, popped holes in the roof, spoke out Crowley, the cop killer with tear gas, right. mounted their machine guns, a crack of pistol fire, and the rat a tat tat of machine guns, fired incessantly at the police. Nothing like it had ever been seen before in the sidewalks of New York. I guess this is before TV, too. When Crowley was captured, Police Commissioner E.P. Mulrooney declared that the two gun desperado was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. So two gun, they captured two gun, they two gun Crowley. Two gun Crowley in New York after a shootout with 150 cops. Yeah, but how did two gun Crowley regard himself? Hmm. We know because while police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern. Hmm. And as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail in the paper. 
Wow, Dale. In this letter, Crowley said, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one. Oh. <laughs> one that would do nobody no harm. That's rough. A short time before this, Crowley had been having a necking party with his girlfriend. A necking party? <laughs> <laughs> and With his girlfriend on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly, a policeman walked up to the car and said, let me see your license. Without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and cut the policeman down <gasps> with a shower of lead. <laughs> As the dying officer fell, Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prostrate body. And this was the killer who said, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one. One that would do nobody no harm. When he arrived at the death house in Sing Sing, did he say, this is what Doesn't I get for good. killing people? No, he said, this is what I get for defending myself. If Al Capone, Two Gun Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about people with whom you and I come in contact? I think I know where this is going. I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100 yeah. people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. Hmm. Okay. Kind of. I'm kind of with the idea of the not criticizing. Yeah. Like, what good does it do? All right. All right. As much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation. The resentment that criticism engenders can demoralize employees, family members, and friends, and still not correct the situation that's been condemned. Oh God, this one's for me. No, isn't it? This oh, one's you too. For me. It's for both of us. Oh my God. Hey, wait. This I is... am so critical. Wait a minute. This is chapter one. This is the most important I'm, one. I'm 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 less critical of others than I am of myself, but I know it doesn't come out that way. Oh my God. Uh oh. Okay. Here we go. George, here's Wait, another name drop. Can though. I time out for just one oh, second? Oh yeah, sure, no problem. I'll be right back. I do want to get I into this name something. drop, though. I mean, right, we got a name. We got to find day. out who Dale. That's the one thing about the book, I will say. Dale, uh, he does know a lot of people, and he doesn't mind throwing them into the book. He just. I think they might want to be in the book. No, I know they want to be in the book. I think he's like, hey. I think he even talks about this at some point later. I, I remember reading the book a long time ago. And there was a chapter, I think, on like naming stadiums after people or something. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. On how to, how to get stadiums named after yourself? No, how to get a stadium built is to name it after somebody rich. Oh. I think that that's been practiced throughout American history even. Right. In fact, now we name them after corporations. That's anyway, that's true. we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, okay. There. George. <laughs> that's just wrong. George B. Johnson of Enid, Oklahoma, is the safety coordinator for an engineering company. One of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats whenever they are on the job and in the field. Oh, wow, George. Run around telling people to put their hat after he left. The workers would just remove the hats. Might not have been that popular. Mm. I bet he didn't get invited out. He didn't go to the, the guys after, after work. Drink huh? shit. He decided to try a different approach. Next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant voice that the hat was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased compliance with the regulation with no resentment <coughs> or emotional upset. You'll find examples of the futility of criticism bristling on a thousand pages of history. They take, for example, the famous quarrel between Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft. All right, see, that's a context. To a famous... So at, at the point of this writing, there had been it, a famous take quarrel. Take, for example... The Logan Paul fight or whatever. Right, exactly. You know, and people would be like, oh yeah, the famous Logan Paul fight. I had no idea all this happened. Theodore Roosevelt blames Taft. But did President Taft blame himself? No. Of course not. Who was to blame? Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know. And I don't care. Uh, that goes for me too, buddy. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is that all of Theodore Roosevelt's criticism did not persuade Taft that he was wrong. 
It merely made Taft strive to justify himself and to reiterate with tears in his eyes, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. There you are. Human nature in action. Wrongdoers blaming everybody but themselves. We're all like that. So when you and I are tempted to criticize someone tomorrow, let's remember Al Capone, Two Gun Crowley, and Albert Fall. All right, maybe. I, I'll, I Maybe. Let's realize their criticisms are like homing pigeons. They always return home. <laughs> On the morning of April 15th, 1865. Oh, Jesus. Abraham Lincoln lay dying in a hall bedroom of a cheap lodging house directly above the street from Ford's Theater, where John Wilkes Booth had shot him. Lincoln's body lay stretched diagonally across a sagging bed that was too short for him. A cheap reproduction of Rosa Bonhauer's famous painting, The Horse Fair, hung above the bed, and a dismal gas jet flickered yellow light. Wow. Wow, where are we going with this? I Dale? don't know. He keeps going on these he tangents. He goes on these crazy... It's, we're into the presidents now, though. Yeah. Dale's been well acquainted with presidents, and they, you know... Of War Stanton said, There lies the most perfect ruler of men that the world has ever seen. What was the secret of Lincoln's success in dealing with people? I studied the life of Abraham Lincoln for 10 years and devoted all of three years to writing and rewriting a book entitled Lincoln the Unknown. I believe I've made myself as detailed and exhaustive wow. study of Lincoln's personality and home life as it is possible for any being to make. <laughs> Did he indulge in criticism? Oh, yes. As a young man in the Pigeon Creek Valley of Indiana, he not only criticized, but he wrote letters and poems ridiculing people and dropped these letters on the country roads where they were sure to be found. That was old social media. That's mm -hmm. funny. One of these letters aroused resentments that burned for a lifetime. He ridiculed a vain, pugnacious politician by the name of James Shields. Lincoln lampooned him through an anonymous letter published in the Springfield Journal. The town roared with laughter. Shields, sensitive and proud, boiled with indignation. He found out who wrote the letter, leapt on his horse and started after Lincoln and challenged him to fight a duel. Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was opposed to dueling. But he couldn't get out of it and save his honor. Mm. He and Shields met on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to the death. But at the last minute... Their seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. This was the most lurid personal incident in Lincoln's life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the art of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insulting letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. Wow, really? Malice toward none with charity for all held his peace. One of his favorite quotations was, Judge not, that ye not be judged. This guy's really into Lincoln. This is kind of funny, though. Yeah. Deuged the country with rain. When Lee reached the Potomac with his... Potomac? <laughs> Potomac. Potomac, right? Potomac. Potomac. With his defeated army, he found a swollen, impassable river in front of him and a victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. He couldn't escape. Lincoln saw that. There was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity. The opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the war immediately. So a surge of hope. Link ordered... Link... Lincoln ordered Meade not to call a council of war, but to attack Lee immediately. Lincoln telegraphed his orders and then sent a special messenger to Meade demanding immediate action. And what did General Meade do? He did the very opposite of what he was told to do. Oh, he mm. called a council of war in direct violation of Lincoln's orders. He hesitated. He procrastinated. He telegraphed all manner of excuses. He refused point blank to attack Lee. In bitter disappointment, Lincoln sat down and wrote Meade this letter. It was tantamount to the severest rebuke. Mm -hmm. My dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp and to have closed upon him would in connection with our other late successes have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river when you can take with you very few, no more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect, that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I'm distressed immeasurably because of it. Well, Meade never read the letter. <laughs> Lincoln never mailed it. It was found among his papers after his death. Oh. <laughs> what are we saying here? 
It's odd because there's it's an odd story to have told because there's no happy ending there. Really, like next time it didn't show that like next time Mead like really just nutted up and attacked or whatever. It doesn't. I guess the lesson though is it doesn't matter because. It doesn't matter. There's no point in being mad, basically. It doesn't help. It doesn't affect any positive change. Yeah, okay. So it's wasted effort. But he does kind of go off on these long tangents. He does go off on a lot of tangents. And then take you this direction. You're like, where are we going with this? We're going to read now. We're going to read some something about Father Forgets. It's about criticism. I think the the chapter, and I know this is... It's hard to remember because he really does go off sometimes. He really wants to drive every point home. Like So... A bunch. Why are we talking about planes and then he went to Father Magazine or something? Well, we're f trying to figure that out. Because he's about minutes. to tell us some <clears throat> little anecdote about why you, you shouldn't, shouldn't criticize. criticize your children. Mm -hmm. Why you shouldn't be, yeah, why you shouldn't criticize your children. I guess that makes sense. Why would you criticize them? All right. Listen, son, I'm saying this as you lie asleep. One little paw crumpled under your cheek. Scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called it angrily when you threw so many things on the floor. At breakfast, I found fault too. You spilled things. You gulped down your food. You put your elbows on the table. You spread your butter too thick in your bread. As you started off to play, I made for my train. You turned and waved a hand and called, Goodbye, Daddy. And I frowned. I said, Hold your shoulders back. Oh, oh no. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need me to read this one? around my neck and kissed me and your small arms tightened with an affection that God had set blooming in your heart and which even neglect could not wither. <laughs> Get the belt. Bitch, I said my Saturdays were reserved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow. So principle one. There was principle one. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. These are the rules for winning friends and influencing people. Yeah, the whole aim Not of this for, book, like, we have to remember that too. to the world. Yeah, this, this is for a particular aim. Right, right. There's no, yeah. Yeah, it does nothing to address like social injustice or anything. Right, exactly. But that's not how the book is framed. It's right. just to win friends and influence people, follow this rule. Don't right. criticize, condemn, or complain. Basically, part of the things when he was saying how to get the most out of the book was that you had to practice it. So this, instead of rushing on, too, that was another one. You don't rush on. Right. We're going to have sort of a week to, like, try practice to not. Practice that principle. But the principle is don't criticize. And if you want to do this, with, we're trying to stay accountable to this. So this week, really. We're going to try that. We're going to try to follow this principle. When I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Instead, I'm going to say something else. Stick around here and you'll get it. Right, so in three chapters, like don't magic. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Right. There's the advice. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain for the whole week. Instead, you know, and I think here was part of the story. Be empathetic. Instead, offer to help. We'll be back next weekend, Saturday. We'll next Cheers. Good vibes till next Good time, everybody. <laughs>